I want to start to get us back on to focus with the processor. Instruction level parallelism is the idea that we can overlap instructions to improve performance. So we have instructions executing in parallel. Instruction level parallelism is basically what a pipeline exploits. It exploits just purely the overlap parallelism. And we've talked about performance of pipelines. We've talked about stalls for data hazards when you do or don't have forwarding, and control stalls when you have to squash mispredicted instructions. And this just shows a multi-cycle pipeline diagram showing a five-stage pipeline for a snippet of some code. Uh, red is waste, waste is bad. Whatever we can do to improve our CPI is good. Where do those data hazards come from? Well, they come from data dependencies in the data flow of a program. So here's an example of a little snippet of generic risk of code, adding into R1 the values of R2 plus R3, and then a branch, and then subtracting into R1, and after the branch, having an OR operation for R1. And the R1 of OR depends on either the add or the subtract, depending on the branch outcome. These data dependencies, they come in multiple forms. The true dependence between two instructions, sometimes this is called a read after write dependence. One instruction, J, reads the operand after I has written to it. So reading after it's been written. This becomes a hazard in the pipeline if J attempts to read the operand before I manages to write to it. True dependence becomes a raw hazard if in the pipeline, J is allowed to read from R1 before I is allowed to write to it. And we solve this hazard with data forwarding, value bypassing, which is a more efficient way of solving this problem than stalling. Data dependencies are a property of programs. They're a property of the order of instructions in a program, the order in which instructions are executed, as well as the registers allocated to the different variables of the program. Data dependencies bring about the possibility of a hazard. They don't necessarily mean there's a hazard. In general, there may be some kinds of data hazards, data dependencies that you cannot resolve solely by forwarding. You may need to also insert some bubbles, some stalls in the pipeline. So the load use hazard in a risk processor is one example where you need to have forwarding and a stall cycle. To resolve data dependencies, we have to make sure that the order of the program order is preserved. The data dependencies limit how much parallelism can be exploited. They fundamentally limit how much you can parallelize a program because they impose constraints on how much you can overlap and reorder the execution of instructions of the program. The existence of the hazards and the addition of stall cycles are a property of the pipeline implementation and how the processor has been designed. The goal of instruction level parallelism is to increase how much parallelism you have while preserving program order where it affects the outcome of the program. And program order is the notion of sequential execution of the program's instructions as well as preserving the branch behavior. A basic block is a straight line code sequence with one entry and one exit. No branches in except possibly to the entry and no branches out except possibly at the exit. The entries and exits may also be labels or branch instructions. Entry of a basic block may be a branch out to a block. In a chunk of C code, you can kind of get to understand what the basic blocks are by looking at the straight line sequence. And you can construct this control flow graph of the basic blocks. So this is a basic block flow graph where we've labeled these different basic blocks B1, B2, B3, B4, and showing that you enter the program in B1, and then you have a split. You can either go to B2 or B3, and that's gonna depend on the if conditional there. You merge the control flow back together in B4 before exiting. These control flow graphs are heavily used in compilers to optimize program behavior. They're also important to understand in the processor in order to get a sense of the limits to which parallelism can help us to improve performance. Data dependencies between instructions may be either from the registers, which is what we've talked about mostly, or you can also have dependencies between memory locations. We haven't talked too much about that. Data flow in a register, it's pretty much straightforward especially within a single basic block. You know what the registers are and you can keep track of them. In between basic blocks, it can be a little harder since you have to kind of track where things have jumped from and to in order to understand what the data flow looks like. Dependencies through memory locations are much more difficult 
to detect, especially at the compiler level, because, for example, two seemingly different memory operands, zero offset from R1 and four offset from R2, can be the same if R1 is equal to four plus R2. This can cause quite a lot of problems, and we're going to come back and revisit this in the future when we talk about data dependencies between memory instructions, different processor designs. Another kind of data dependency is the anti-dependence, sometimes called a name dependency, two instructions that use the same register or memory location, but they don't actually have data flow between them. They have a name dependence. There's two kinds of name dependencies. One is the write after read, which is known as anti-dependence. The other is write after write, which is known as output dependence. And so uh, instruction J writes to R1 after I reads it. This would be a hazard if we allowed J to write to R1 before I read it. The reason this is called a name dependency is because it only arises because the compiler allocated register R1 for the destination of J. If the compiler had allocated the name R8 instead of R1, then there'd be no dependency. So this is also why we don't really call these true dependencies. They're not data flow dependencies. They're dependencies in name only. So if an anti-dependence cause a hazard in the pipeline, this is called a write after read hazard. And then the other kind of name dependency, the output dependence happens when two instructions write to the same name. I writes its result to R1. J writes its result to R1. And the reason there's a dependence here is simply because the compiler has allocated R1 to both of these. The compiler would not actually generate this specific snippet of code because the compiler would be smart enough to realize that, well, J is actually getting rid of R1 and R1 is never used. So that sub R1, R4, R3 is dead code and we can eliminate it. But it still happens. These write after write hazards happen. So if the write of J is allowed to happen before the write of I in a pipeline, then this would be a write after write hazard. Now we don't have write after write hazards in our in order pipeline, but we are going to encounter them probably. You can fix all name dependencies with a sufficiently large enough set of registers, which is part of the reason why RISC processors have a lot of registers. They give the compiler more freedom to fix the name dependencies. And then control dependencies arise from jumps branches where basic blocks are control dependent on conditional statements. Here, the statement S1 is control dependent on the statement P1, and the statement S2 is control dependent on the statement P2, but S2 is not control dependent on P1 unless P2 is changed by S1. There's a data flow from S1 to P2, then there's a control dependence from P1 through S1 to P2. Control dependencies are also pretty important in uh, compilers. The control dependencies make it so that an instruction that depends on a branch can't be moved before that branch. An instruction that is not control dependent on a branch cannot be moved after that branch so that it depends on the branch. When we talked about finding instructions to put into branch delay slots, we kind of alluded to this notion of control dependence by saying that the compiler has to find instructions that are safe to move into that branch slot because those instructions can be executed regardless of the branch outcome. So instructions that are dependent on a branch cannot be in a branch delay slot. Instructions that are not control dependent on a branch can be in a branch delay slot. That could be another way to maybe think about this idea of control dependence. Sometimes you can also deal with control dependencies by duplicating instructions or by undoing their effect. The compiler can do that. Basic blocks have a limited amount of instruction level parallelism. The reason for this is that a basic block is usually manipulating the same data within a local region of the program. Branch frequency in some kinds of programs seems to tend about 15 to 25% of instructions, which means that there's roughly three to six instructions between each pair of branches, which means each basic block is roughly three to six instructions long. And instructions in a basic block are highly likely to depend on each other. The moral of this story is that we want to find ways to exploit instruction level parallelism across basic blocks. The most prevalent approach to this is called loop level parallelism. Here we have a very simple loop for i equals 1000, i is greater than zero, decrement i, x of i is equal to x of i plus s. Adding a scalar value s to every element of some array x. The loop body in assembly is shown here. Load into t0, the value at t1. Add t0 plus t2 into t4. 
and store T4 back into T1. Here, T1 is pointer of X of I, and then we're going to decrement our pointer T1 and then branch back to our loop if we're not done yet. So this is a basic block because it has one entry and one exit, the entry at the loop label, the exit at the branch statement. And this basic block is going to repeat a thousand times when it executes. Because of data hazards, the parallelism that can be exploited within this basic block is somewhat reduced. We have to have two stall cycles injected in a five-stage pipeline that has forwarding because there's a load use hazard here between the load word and the add. And there's also a penalty for the branch in a decode stage because it's dependent on the add I. One, two, three, four, five, five instructions, and we'll assume seven clock cycles because of the stall penalty, which means approximately 7,000 cycles, assuming that the branch can be predicted accurately, which is a reasonable assumption. Can we rewrite this code to minimize the stalls? One thing we can do is exchange the order of some of these operations. So we can decrement our pointer by four after we load word from X of I and everything just moves down one, but then we've got this uh, this additional add T1, T3, zero, moving the value that we calculate there of T3 into T1. This one extra line of what's called compensation code to compensate for what we had to move up. We move our stalls, six instructions, so we'll assume six clock cycles. So we've improved by a thousand clock cycles, so that's good. But we can do better still by noticing that instruction set allows us to put an offset value on our store word, so we actually don't need that compensation code. We can just use an offset of four from T1. We do our subtraction by four earlier, and we increase the offset from zero to four. So we can get this down to five clock cycle, which is really pretty good. Two of these though, this add I decrementing the pointer, and the branch are still overhead. They're what's considered loop overhead. To reduce the amount of loop overhead, we can do something called loop unrolling. The idea of loop unrolling is that you take the loop body and you essentially copy and paste it multiple times and you adjust each loop body for the iterator variable here, value i, which is decrementing by one every time by four bytes. When we copy and paste the loop body multiple times, we use negative multiples of four as the displacement in the memory operands instead of adjusting T1 every time. Our first loop iteration becomes load word add store word. Our second loop iteration is load word add store word now with negative four. Our third iteration is load word add store word with negative eight. And our fourth loop body there pasted in there is load word add store word with negative 12. And then we can adjust T1 by 16 for the four bodies that we pasted in there and branch. So now we've got 19 clock cycles for each iteration, where each iteration is now doing four times as much real work, which means it takes 4,750 cycles in total, which is better than 5,000 cycles in total for the previous version. We could calculate the speed up, right? 5,000 divided by 4,750. That would tell us our speed up. The cost we pay for loop unrolling in general is that the code size increases. One thing you'll see is to follow up unrolling with scheduling. So here, if we look at this, there's actually, there's a load use hazard in every single one of these loop bodies. We can remove those load use hazards by rearranging the order of the instructions in the unrolled loop. So now we do all our loads and then we do all our ads. Then we do all of our, most of our stores. We inject one store word in between our adjustment of the iterator variable and the branch to get rid of the stall between the add I and the branch. So this is called instruction scheduling. Compiler generally does this in order to improve the performance of a sequence of code. This gets the loop body down to 14 clock cycles. It would repeat 250 times because that's a thousand divided by four. 14 clock cycles repeated 250 times is 3,500 clock cycles. We calculate our speed up as well. Again, 4,750 divided by 3,500, for example. This does require us to have additional registers to keep those values that we load from memory. Uh, again, having more registers gives the compiler more freedom to do compiler optimizations, which is one of the benefits of a risk processor. Of the five different versions, we can compare their their performances. We could calculate the speed up. What's the speed up of V5 over V1? Well, it's 7,000 divided by 3,500 or two. 
loop unrolling requires that the loop iterations are independent of each other. A lot of registers available to fix name dependencies and the capability to adjust the loop iteration code and memory disambiguation so that you know whether or not you're loading and storing the same values. There is a cost associated with it. As you continue to unroll each time, you double the number of unrollings, you are only cutting your loop overhead instructions by one. So you get diminishing returns for unrolling. You have to pay with a larger code size, which can increase your instruction cache miss rate and then register pressure. Uh, eventually you may run out of available registers to allocate. I don't know. I had fun.